Good morning. Bring us peace indeed. What a beautiful way to enter this Remembrance Sunday. I'm Reverend Beth Hayward and I welcome you to this place and this time of worship where we come together for our spirits to be fed, to, uh, to just pause before we head into another week that uh, our hearts might be opened once again uh, to operate from a place of love and peace. Whoever you are and wherever you're coming from, you're welcome today. And, and just as we gather, I want to share with you uh, some of the history of this place. And I know many in the pews could tell this story of our founding uh, pastor, George Fallis, a Reverend Fallis, um, who came back from World War I and was determined to make a national chapel for peace. And this is the result, this building here at the corner of Burrard and 15th. Uh, he had the, the wherewithal to want to make it a really national church. And uh, each of the windows here represents one of the provinces in the Yukon Territory. There is the chancel window that you will see at the end of the service behind me. We will pull the screen up quickly so people can see that. Uh, and the All Canada window uh, that I face every Sunday beautiful stories. Look at these any time that you are in this space and uh, wrestle with uh, their beauty, the stories they tell, the way they tell those stories and how that lands for you. And uh, we also will open today the books of remembrance. Uh, as you likely know, we are the only place outside of Ottawa that holds these books and it is our honor and privilege to steward them. Uh, if you have family members, uh, ancestors who died in the wars, you are welcome to stay after the service to, uh, as we open the books for all who are here. So however you come this day, and whoever you are, above all else, we come that we might be fed in spirit. And so I urge you to let your voices fill this place. Let's sing together.
You can be seated, and um, you'll you'll welcome that band. Sure. Now, why don't you do that now, yeah. Jay? Yeah. Good uh, morning. They've been blessed with them. Uh, my name is Jay Esplana. I'm the director of music ministry here at Kenema Memorial, and I'm very excited to share with you a group of people who are very dear to me. Um, mm -hmm. These are my friends. Uh, to my left, right behind me, is Mr. Elliot Lowe on guitar, and you'll see him playing alto <laughs> saxophone. Mr. Elliot Lowe. On the gigantic violin, the upright bass, <laughs> Mr. Graham Clark, <laughs> laying down the law. To my right, you've seen him before, <laughs> never gets old, Mr. Malcolm Aiken on the trumpet. We're very excited to be here with you. We're going to be offering you a bunch of tunes reimagined in this setting, so enjoy. Thank you. Uh, so good to have these special musicians with us today and uh, grateful for their presence. Also for parents and caregivers, the children, uh, we are not calling them forward right now. Urge them to stay through a very special offering by the Story Guild. And then if there are children who want to go for their programs, you'll leave uh, right after the story presentation. If any feel like you want to stay and see what this is all about, you're welcome to stay. So it's everyone's choice. Now, I'm going to light this candle. Um, of course, symbols of light are so very powerful and so rich with meaning. But I urge you to just let these words of prayer flow over you and through you as I light this candle today. We honor this day those who served in war, we lift up our appreciation for their service in a world of tyranny and inhumanity. Our prayers, O Holy One, are that some way, somehow, we come to the table of peace and find a way for lion and lamb to lay together at the feet of our world leaders. We to find a way to be compelled to turn our swords into plowshares. And may this light be a reminder to each of us that peace starts in our own hearts. May it be born there this day. In Christ's name, amen. Solitude of longing Where love has been 
I'll maybe just take a moment and let you know about the Burrard Street Story Guild. It's uh, part of our story arts program. The youth meet on Friday afternoons and uh, we work on different uh, projects that's, that uh, are to build resiliency in heart, um, spirit, mind and body for, for the young people in the context of a faith community. And we normally do a biblical story, but on this particular Sunday, we wanted to tell the story of the founding of Canadian Memorial.
Methodist preacher, Reverend Fallis, served as a chaplain with the World War I Canadian Expeditionary Forces from 1914 to 1918. Reverend Fallis deeply grieved the loss of young life on the battlefield and the devastation of war. Christus Dominus est, Christus Dominus est, Sangre Samisa est, Amor in Venta, Christus Dominus est, Christus Dominus est, Luna Magis Persia, Christ, 
On his return to Canada, Reverend Fallis raised funds to build a memorial chapel remembering those who had fought and died. Reverend Fallis's vision extended beyond remembering the war dead. To nurture a culture of peace, a community center was built alongside the Memorial Chapel. In 1923, the Memorial Hall, later to be known as the Center for Peace, opened to community events, from dancing to eating to swimming to praying.
And in 2022, the people of Canadian Memorial United Church continued to carry forward the peace-building legacy of their forebearers. Any children who'd like to join Tama and the other children may continue with them in the Center for Peace. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tama, and the children. That was beautiful. Um, now is when the hospitality team will pass around the baskets, uh, the offering plates. So if they could start doing that. And then we just have one announcement, which is from Tony Peroni. Thank you. Wow, that was so moving. <laughs> oh, well, I'm Tony Peroni, and as most of you know, I'm the chairperson of our search committee that's look, going to be looking for a new lead minister when Beth leaves us in the spring. So first of all, I just want to thank all of you that participated in the Fireside Chaps, both the on in person and online, and who've submitted feedback to us from the Survey Monkey, um, we're going to be providing a report of the feedback you've given us, uh, compiling it around certain themes that emerge from the feedback that we gave. That will be probably available later this month or early December, because right now we're in the, um, the work of putting together the profile that we need to put up on Church Hub, Hub so we can begin our search process. So, one of the things that came out of the fireside chats was a little bit of confusion about what this process actually is. So I thought, and Beth agreed, that it'd be a good idea for me to do a little um, kind of a tutorial, I guess, on the process that we're in. So as you can see, Zanera has done this beautiful graphic for us. And there are four steps, basically, that um, we are following. And these, these really follow the guidelines that are put out by the United Church in their pastoral relations website. And there is a, um, a whole document that if you want to go to that website, you can read the whole document because this is what we're following. So essentially the four steps are this. And what we're engaged in right now in this month of November is completing the community of faith profile, which also includes the job description of the, uh, prof or the position that we're looking for. When we get that finished, which will be shortly, this will be reviewed by our regional supervisor. And uh, our new regional supervisor is Dr. Uh, Reverend B Deb Bowman. Um, our former one had to take a medical leave, so we've been a little bit waiting for um, a new person to be put in place. Once she reviews it and gets, gives us feedback and we make any revisions that are necessary, then it goes to the board for the board approval, and then once that is completed, then it's presented to you, the congregation, for approval. And we have targeted November 27th to hold a congregation, congregational meeting in order to um, present that profile and have you vote on it. That will then be reviewed by the Pacific Region Working Group, and uh, once that's all approved, then it can go up on Church Hub and, um, and we can begin the search process. So we're hoping to have all of that done by the 1st of December. We'll see how that goes, but that's our target date. Then the second step, which I'm not quite sure, I think it's the, the uh, kind of magenta cover on the right, that begins the search process, which will occur somewhere between December and February. Uh, during that time, the candidates who are uh, approaching us, uh, all of that is held in confidentiality by the members of the search committee. Because if someone is looking for a position, they would not want their uh, congregation to be aware that they're looking. So all of that needs to be kept co totally confidential. So we search for candidates on Church Hub. People who are looking for positions can go to Church Hub, read our profile, and submit an application to us then the promising candidates are shortlisted and reviewed by the Office of Vocation Minister and the Regional Supervisor. 
We're hoping to begin first interviews in February, and then we'll be bringing those down to who we would see for second interviews sometime in late February and March. And uh, by then, we hope to find uh, the candidate. We will begin the um, kind of negotiation on the terms by mid-March. Then it's submitted to the board for approval, and then it will be submitted to you as a congregation by the end of March uh, for approval. And, um, and then hopefully by then we will have a candidate in place by the, April 1st. The third part of the process then begins a, uh, the start of a new pastoral relationship with this person between April and June. And then on July 1st, uh, that will begin this new pastoral relationship with a new lead minister. So that's the essential guidelines. I'm going to ask Zanera to put that graphic up on the website so that you can look at it and see the steps that we're following. But we just wanted to lay that out and that we really are guided in this process by um, our regional supervisor at the United Church. Thank you. And also, please remember, you can donate uh, on our website uh, to support um, both this process and also all our children's programs, our music department, all the other good work we're doing here. Uh, may all the work we bring into this community um, go forward to help others in the wider community. May we be a blessing and treasure for one another and know that we can always support each other. Thank you. I'm tired and so weary, but I must go alone till the Lord comes and calls me, calls me away. Oh, yes. Well, the morning's so
Good morning. My name is Bob Peacock, and I'm a proud member and former member of the Royal Canadian Navy. Thank you. I stand here honoured to be able to bring to you the names from the books of remembrance that are held in such high esteem in this place. Major Clarence A. Baker, Royal Canadian Artillery, died June the 18th, 1944. Flying Officer George A. Edgett, Royal Canadian Air Force, died October 6, 1942, age 28. Roswell Murray McTavish, Royal Canadian Air Force, died March 18, 1944, age 25. Pilot Officer George B. Sanderson, Royal Canadian Air Force, died May 26, 1944. Flight Sergeant Robert P. Shannon, Jr., Royal Canadian Air Force, died May 20th, 1942. Flight Officer William Wilkie, Royal Canadian Air Force, died January 14th, 1944. Sergeant Vincent Nelson, Royal Canadian Air Force, died November 2nd, 1944, age 18. Private William W. Amon, Army, died November 2nd, 1918, age 30. Donkeyman Saeed Ali, Canadian Merchant Navy, died November 2nd, 1942, age 46. Captain Thomas Wellington Chalmers, Army, died November 2nd, 1900, age 38. Always remembered in our hearts, lest we forget. Please rise as you're able for the last post.
Please be seated. I'll invite those who are bringing the wreaths forward to come at this time. I'm reading today from the second chapter of Isaiah. These verses address a nation facing an uncertain future. The relative prosperity and peace the nations of Israel and Judea experienced during the early 8th century are a distant memory, like a dream one barely remembers after waking. Instead, the relentless advances of the Assyrian Empire have decimated the nation of Israel. Many Israel Israelites escaped Assyria's invasion of their home and sought refuge within Judea and its capital city, Jerusalem. The southern refuge soon confronts the same Assyrian enemy and the hardships a prolonged military siege produces. Against this backdrop of suffering, anxiety, and imminent imperial conquest, the prophet announces he has received a vision concerning God's perspective about Judea and Jerusalem. This prophetic vision promises a future that contradicts the people's present experiences. I invite us to listen to these verses with an awareness of the challenges of the times in which we live and with a curiosity about our part in creating the future to which Isaiah points. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 2, 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judea and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. 
neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the witness of God's people. Thanks be to God. So it is my, um, my great delight to introduce to you now our guest today, our guest for Remembrance Service. Uh, delighted to introduce to you, virtually if you will, Dr. Derek Sutterman. Um, He'll be on your screen if you're uh, at home and behind me here in the church. He is Associate Professor of both Religious and Theological Studies at Conrad Grebel University College in Waterloo, Ontario. So Dr. Sutterman specializes in the Hebrew Bible, which we just heard read from, and he explores the um, diverse cultural and historical contexts that inform biblical interpretation and ethics today. His research interests are quite broad, so I'll just give you a sliver. He explores how the Bible has been used to both justify and oppose violence within the history of the Christian tradition. And he is very interested in the ethical implications of biblical interpretation, particularly on violence, um, and how contemporary issues such as indigenous peoples uh, are related to that interpretation. As an aside, his college in Waterloo offers, offers um, a full scholarship for your tuition if you feel so inclined to go and get yourself a Master's of Theological Studies, like free education, folks. And um, on a personal note, Derek loves to travel. He has taught or spoken in uh, five continents, which is quite a few, and um, has been a lifelong member of the Mennonite Church. So please um, join me in welcoming warmly from Waterloo, Dr. Sutterman. So let's check. This is working. It's good to have you with us, Derek. Thank you. It's good to be here. I um, I first heard of you on an Ideas episode, uh, CBC podcast, and we'll put the link in the YouTube chat so the rest of you can look for that. But it was entitled um, "The Power and Paradox of Turning the Other Cheek," and um, and I'm going to get to some of what Derek said in that in just a moment. But I want to start first of all with. We're here for Remembrance Day. And so I don't know about you, but I find it a tricky day. I don't know that any of us want to glorify war, but we want to, to, um, to honor those who sacrificed. And, and then we feel there's this call towards peace. Like, can you give us some, some of your general thoughts on how do you handle Remembrance Day? Is there, is there a, a way to approach it that, um, that you think might be uh, a good path at this moment in our lives? Well, thank you very much for that question. And perhaps before I answer that specifically, um, hearing the history of your congregation and the description of your church makes me wish I was there in person. Um, so hopefully someday I'll be able to have the chance to, to enter the building and meet some of you in person. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, Remembrance Day is a tricky day. Uh, I often think of when my children came home from an assembly at school and they were puzzled because they were told that people had sacrificed themselves for us. And many times the place where they heard that kind of language was in church. And so they wondered how these two things connected. Uh, for me, I think that, that whatever my views of fighting in war uh, I need to recognize, as your uh, aim suggests, the sacrifice that has been made. And for me, the big question is, uh, do I have the same kind of conviction? Am I willing to send my girls, I have two daughters, uh, off to a place 
where they may or may not and probably would not come back from. And so for me, uh, the sacrifice is inspiring in that sense, even as I have questions about how best to, to uh, wrestle with the question of kind of real politique in our world. Yeah, and that, yeah. Um, it feels even more uh, present for us at this moment in, in world history. Uh, uh, for any of us that are parents, it, it becomes a, a real question that we can relate to, and I think a way that generations haven't had to for a long time. I, I mean, your area is, is Bible, and I think it would be really helpful if the Bible was really clear. <laughs> if the Bible could say to us, all right, peace all the way, or fight uh, for just causes all the way. Can you give us some, um, some sense of, I mean, I've heard you say that you actually think it's a good thing that we have this Bible that gives us mixed messages. It might not be your exact words. What kind of gift does this give us? Why not a God that says, here's how it is, do it the right way? Well, I, I think there is diversity in the Bible. That's the first thing. I do think that there's a kind of a direction within it, uh, within the Christian tradition, and specifically the Christian Bible. Um, my own area of research has often been the Psalms. And within the Psalms, there is the legitimation of violence for one person. Um, and that person uh, is the, the anointed one, the king. And so uh, there are psalms that call for God's support, uh, are thankful for God's support in war, and for taking vengeance on the nations, for instance. Uh, when people go to war, these are often the passages that are, that are employed or that are quoted. Um, within the New Testament, however, uh, this is one of the things that I think is at issue in Jesus' baptism and temptation. Uh, that it, in the baptism it says, you are the son of God, you are my son, which is the language of the king. But then when the temptations come, uh, Jesus explicitly rejects the temptation of kind of taking dominion over the, over the nations. Uh, so I think this is a reinterpretation of the language of the Messiah from the Psalms. Uh, and as followers of that particular Messiah, as Christians, I think that gives a fairly compelling rationale for not entering into, uh, into warfare, but at the same time recognizing that that is a, that is a possibility and always been, has been there within human history. Oh, I, I trust, I, I mean, where where I then start to stumble on, you know, because it's my uh, <laughs> preaching nature to, uh, to keep asking questions of the text, where I then get tripped up in that uh, New Testament reinterpretation of the Messiah is how do we avoid a sense of anti-Semitism when we talk about, well, the Psalms uh, talked about the Messiah um, taking up arms, if you will, but when Jesus came, it was a, a reinterpretation. How do we uh, nuance that message in a way that enables us to see that our siblings in faith, particularly in the Jewish tradition, um, are, are, are themselves not called to violence? Or <laughs> well, where's your answer on that one? I'm sure that's something that you've had to wrestle with too. That's a very good question. Uh, um, well, first of all, for myself, I am less concerned personally in, in what the Jewish take on this is, not because that's not important, but simply because that's not my job. That's, that's, that lies outside of my job description, my tradition. Um, in terms of the anti-Semitism anti question, I think the key thing to remember is that Jesus and virtually all of his disciples are Jewish. Um, and so really in the New Testament, what we have is an inner Jewish discussion about this that later on be, uh, draws in Gentiles. Um, but, but this is not uh, Jesus the Christian arguing with Jews. 
this is mutual discernment. Uh, and we have now evidence of many different branches of Judaism in the first century that had different responses, uh, different answers to these kinds of questions. And today, of course, we have that. Um, we don't need to look beyond our faith. We have different answers to the question of violence within the Christian tradition. Um, do, do you feel there's a more compelling case um, for Christians of this age that we live in uh, towards being advocates for peace? Um, is there justified violence? Where, what do we, <laughs> I guess it's a question not, it's very much what our scriptures say, but it's also how do we interpret them for this moment in time? Well, I think uh, this is where I think the language of Christianity can get involved in things like nationalism or things like, like the idea of wanting to have a Christian nation. Some of these kinds of concepts, I think, drive a certain orientation in the sense that we think that we should be in charge of how things come out. And I think this is one of the big things that's different in the New Testament, is that there's very much the sense that this is a minority group. This is a tiny group within the Roman Empire. The strategy is not somehow to take over the empire, but how to be faithful within the empire. Uh, and so in part, I, I think part of our challenge is facing the idea of what do we do when, when Christianity, when Christians are a majority, for instance, and it may well be the case, if sociologists are correct, that that might actually not be a concern for us very much longer in Canada. <laughs> that perhaps we are going back to the, to the context in which people in the Christian tradition are a minority even in our country, which raises again the, this question of what does it mean to be faithful uh, as a minority within a larger uh, political uh, group or larger political um, body. Yeah, I, I find yeah. It, it's very much um, uh, more prevalent. For those of us who preach each week, uh, no longer living in Christendom, um, we have to be a lot more thoughtful about what we say and what we uh, claim as we become increasingly pushed to the margins. It's actually been a pretty good exercise uh, for me personally. I, one of the um, sort of, I'd almost call it spiritual practices uh, that you lift up, and this you referred to in the interview I first heard you in, and I've read some of your writings on it. Um, this idea of confession and lament, and I, I'm wondering if you can share some thoughts with, with the congregation about that I, I let go of a prayer of confession in church a long time ago because I felt like people didn't need to be uh, reminded so much of their sinful ways. But as I heard you speak about how confession and lament go together, I thought maybe there's actually an opening here for us to find a more full way um, to wrestle with the brokenness in our lives and world. So I know you could write an essay, but a few minutes <laughs> sharing with folks what all that is particularly what laments all about sure well perhaps first of all uh, within the liturgical christian traditions confession is often a dominant way of thinking about the use of the psalms and particularly in liturgy so that there's often a psalm of confession many times in some churches almost every week um, but one of the things that's interesting is that we often don't hear as much the language of the of lament and but what i mean by that is the language of crying out from a situation of distress of trouble and saying things are not right in, in, in the current circumstance. The thing that's interesting is that by far the largest genre within the book of Psalms is the genre of lament. So over 50 Psalms are individual laments and traditionally only about seven are Psalms of confession. And yet many times confession is way out of proportion with lament in terms of how they're, they're understood or, or used in the, in the liturgical setting, especially. Um, and for me, I think the language of lament is really significant because what it's doing is it's saying things are not right. And if people want to set things right, they're a good clue as to what needs to be resolved. Um, within the language of lament, there are two main issues that keep arising. One is the issue of sickness, which we've been thinking about a lot the last few years. And another is the issue of enemies. But often when we think of enemies or we read that kind of language in the Psalms, Sometimes we think of foreign enemies. We think of the, the, you know, the Philistines or the Babylonians or, or something like that in the ancient world. And then we try to come up with contemporary equivalents. 
But one of the things that's interesting is that in the Psalms, there's also the possibility, and actually quite frequently, the idea of enemies that are quite close to us, that are part of our society, that are even part of our family, even part of our church or our religious community. Um, and so the language of lament, I think, is the language of being honest, of calling out to God, um, and in the, in the hearing of other people. So it's not only God's uh, job to address these things, but I think it's also ours. Um, and so maybe one last comment on that. Often when we read the Psalms, for instance, we always place ourselves as the speaker <laughs> so that we are always the hero of the Psalm. And then sometimes that offends us. Like, I can't imagine a time when I could possibly say this. Why is it here? And for me, that's exactly why it's there. Because the other aspect of the Psalms is they always assume community. Even, even when there's an individual calling out to God, it's in the context of a community. And so we can also read the Psalms as the voice of someone else and ask ourselves, where do we place ourselves? How do we, we respond to this kind of a voice uh, in our context? Um, and we could talk more about it, New Testament if you wanted. No, I, I mean it's it's all that's great, <laughs> um, and I'm I'm starting to imagine. Okay, so confession is is uh, me saying here's what I did wrong or someone, um, and lament is that place from the, from to hear the voice of those who have been wronged or hurt or sinned against. Um, yeah, that seems like hard work in our, in our, like a beautiful, fruitful work. But imagine that in our relationship with Indigenous peoples in this country, um, to hear those. And then, and then I suppose the next step is, is the then what, right? When we start hearing those voices. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and notice that, that if, we, if we maintain the language exclusively of confession, we are basically only hearing the voice of the offender. And so we are still only talking about the people who have done wrong. We are not yet hearing the voice of the victim who has been wronged. Um, and so given your example, I think that's a very clear example where the language of lament can push us to hear a voice that sometimes is silenced. Wow. Um, all right, um, time goes quickly. One, one final question for you, Derek. Um, in, in the prophet Isaiah that we read from today, there's talk of, um, in the introduction, I, I said that the people imagined, um, was presented before them, a future that contradicts their, their current reality. So we might have differences in how we define the current reality of the world, but there's a lot to worry us. It, how would you urge people to go about that beginning of imagining, um, I think, the, the Christian call to a different future? Something that seems completely untenable at this point. Sure. Well, one of the things that I think, um, if Jesus were talking on CNN today, uh, probably one of the first comments that he would get is, you're being unrealistic. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. One of the things that Jesus re talks about all the time is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is here. And every time we hear the, the language of the kingdom of God, we should also, I think, imagine not the empire of Rome. It, it's contrast. And so the question is, where do you put your allegiance? And in putting your allegiance there, what difference does it make? And so I think in part, the, the gospels and the, the life of Jesus is a call to being that strange people. Even those or how we will ultimately get there, there's a challenge there to live quite differently and not by the logic of the empire um, in which, in which uh, he was situated and perhaps in which we might, be, we might find ourselves um, today. If I, can, if I could just kind of um, yeah. bring Go back ahead. what I was saying about <laughs> lament. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things that I think is really interesting is that the temptation for Jesus was to be the conquering militaristic messiah that the Psalms talks about. And what we have in the Gospels is a shift to the language of lament. So if you would have me come back <laughs> during, the, during, the Lent, during the Lent series or, or you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> one of the things that's really interesting is that instead of using the conquering militaristic language, Jesus is one who suffers, who says, my God, my God, have, why have you forsaken me? And then by implication, I think God, Emmanuel, God with us, suffers alongside those who are suffering. So, so Jesus turns from the idea of justifying using violence to make others suffer 
to taking violence on into his own body and and accepting that himself. Uh, and so, in a sense, I think Jesus is the ultimate solidarity with those who suffer. Um, so that's that's one way of thinking about the the logic of lament and how it links into the Gospels and the New Testament language. Beautiful. Yes, the uh, the fellow sufferer who understands. Um, Derek, I, I thank you for joining us in this way. I, I thank Andrew McCord for um, setting it up and <laughs> allowing us to meet in this beautiful hybrid format and um, wish you blessings on your work. And thank you for giving us something to take away and to reflect on on this important day. Thank you so much, Derek. You're welcome. All right. All right. We're going to uh, carry on with song, and uh, we hope to see you again. <laughs>
Beautiful. Let us pray. Spirit of life, we dream of a world free of poverty and oppression. We yearn for a world free of vengeance and violence. We pray for your peace. Our hearts ache for the victims of war and oppression. May we trust the call to be a people of healing love, a people who trust our part to play in bringing comfort and healing to minds and spirits broken by violence. When the injustice of this world seems too much for us to handle, may we know hope that what we have to offer will be enough. When fear of the power and opinions of others tempts us not to speak up for the least amongst us, may we know courage to risk following a way of peace. When we feel ourselves fill with anger at those who are violent and oppressive, may we be a people of compassion. When we tell ourselves that we've given all we can to bring peace into this world, may we remember Jesus' gift of self-giving love. May we know courage, patience, serenity, self-honesty, and the gentleness of spirit that are needed in a world that would tell us fear and violence are the only way. We offer these prayers and the prayers of our hearts for self, neighbor, stranger, and earth. Amen. And now please stand as you are able for the next song. to join us for virtual coffee hour if you are live and online and uh, to come over to the Center for Peace. Uh, you can congratulate the children on their beautiful storytelling. You can meet with one another. You can um, just enjoy what it feels like um, when the work of living your faith hits the ground. So I invite you to hang around with each other for a while. And don't forget, we will be opening the books of remembrance as soon as we're able following the service. The voices of fear and want and greed, they're pretty loud. And so I urge you this week to instead attune your ears to the fierce whispers of peace and hope and love and follow with reckless abandon where those voices might lead you. Go in peace to love and serve others. Go in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Amen.